scripture reminds us that God is in control. Isn't that wonderful? And he's a God of second chances. You mess up and you're done. Aren't you glad God is not like that? <laughs> Some parents are like that. Some people are like that. God is not like that. There's a little history we should look at before we, get, before we jump into chapter 4. The Babylonian Empire has been conquered. And Cyrus is the new, the new man in town. And Cyrus has a soft spot in his heart for the Jewish people. Because God is working on his heart. So if you'll hold your finger in Ezra, excuse me, in Esther, and go to the book of Ezra. You don't read Ezra very often. It's a great book. Ezra chapter 1. Could be entitled, The Great Exodus. It says, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Verse 2, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and... He has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is Judea. Verse 3, whoever is among you, all of this people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judea, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. That's pretty amazing insight, isn't it, for a Persian king. Ezra tells us about 15,000 Jews of the several million who, who resided now in Persia. 15,000 would heed this call. We have dropped in the bucket. They would go. We usually wonder why Esther's parents or her grandparents why they didn't go? Why Esther was still in Persia? And we're not told why, but we know that God had a plan for her. In the next line of rule of the book of Esther, we come to King Azarius, better known as Xerxes. He's not so friendly toward Jews. In fact, He's one of the kings that's involved in stopping the building of the temple. Now, what happens in chapter 4? You ever watch one of these movies about the end of the world? Some meteorite is coming. And news reporters are trying to tell people that it's going to be catastrophic. And as people hear the story, they have different reactions. Some become totally unbridled and they do any everything that ever wanted to do that was evil. And if you ever watched any of these riots that take place, you see people running into stores, <coughs> stealing TVs and anything they can grab. There are others who are so stunned they just stand there. They're just paralyzed. Others are looking for their families. If it's, a, if it's a well written movie, its goal is to ask you a question. If this was your situation, if, if you knew that soon the end was coming, what would you do? Would you be one who would riot? Would you be one who would throw himself into drugs and alcohol or seek in your family? What would you do if you knew the end was coming? And in chapter 4, the king sends out this proclamation to tell all the Jews that in 11 months, they're going to be annihilated. And you can imagine as the people went to the gates, to the gates of the cities where important messages were given, 
and they would listen to a man who was about to read the king's proclamation. And the decree said that the, that the people would be killed, destroyed, and annihilated. And after 11 months, there would be no Jews left. And God's people would be destroyed. And the author of Esther is asking you that same question. If you were there, hearing that report, what would you do? And the question the author is asking is one that we cannot, cannot avoid or ignore. Because God's people face the same kind of crisis. Before Jesus comes, what will you do with your life? As you hold your, your finger in Esther, I'm going to jump over to 1 Thessalonians 5, which says, For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. In other words, we don't know when he's coming. So it's, it's, it's needful and important that we be ready today. He goes on to say, while people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. The world is coming to an end. We just don't know when. Like a thief of the night. And it is coming. Like a pregnant woman. She knows it's going to come. I remember when Karen was pregnant with our daughter. She exercised, she walked. She couldn't wait for the day when she finally gave birth to her child, our child. Back pains, you ladies know all the symptoms of that. And when the, when the city heard this report, it was mass confusion. Notice how Mordecai responds in verse 1, chapter 4. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the midst of the city and cried out with a loud and bitter cry. Now, Mordecai does more than just tear his clothes and put on ashes. He goes to the king's gate. Because he's trying to get an audience with Esther. And when Esther hears that her adopted father-in-law has tore his clothes and that he's put ashes upon himself and he's weeping and wailing, she doesn't know why. So she does the only logical thing to do. She goes to Macy's and buys new clothes for Mordecai. And she is a queen. She certainly she wouldn't go to Walmart. And Mordecai will have nothing to do with it. Notice verse 3. says, Here are each and every province where the king's edict law were announced. There were, was considerable mourning among the Jews. Along with fasting, weeping, sorrow, sackcloth and ashes were characteristics. When, when you hear a person who in sackcloth and ashes, it's not just mourning, but they are appealing to the King of Kings. They are talking to God and asking for his intervention. Now, many of us have never felt like Mordecai feels in this passage. Many of us have never felt the crushing weight of impending destruction. John Revelator describes in the book of Revelation. Instead, many of us, most of us are like Esther. We don't know what's going on. We know in our minds that Jesus is coming. We know in our minds that there will be a time of tribulation. But we're more focused on is there going to be enough food for haystacks? Or who we're going to talk to? Or who we're going to spend the day with? Rather than 
I'll be ready to spend eternity with Jesus. 2 Peter 3 7. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, and it's the entire world, everything, everything that we hold precious, our cars, our houses, our gardens, our children, everything we hold precious, Peter says, we burn away. And so then Peter asked this question, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the Son of God? Peter doesn't say you should have, you should be up on your most recent conspiracy things. But he says, no, you should be holy and righteous. Verse 7, so then Mordecai related to him, in other words, Esther sends her eunuch and says, find out why Mordecai is upset. And so he explains to the eunuch the specific amount of money that Haman has offered to pay to the king's treasury for the Jews to be destroyed. And he tells the servant, when you go back to Esther, verse 8, he says, the last part of verse 8, it says, command her to go to the king and beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. Now, Mordecai is used to fixing things. And he's trying to fix this situation. The problem is, there is no human solution to fixing this problem. Mordecai has no plan B. In 11 months, everybody's going to be destroyed, including himself and including Esther. At this stage of the story, Mordecai thinks, if I can just get to Esther, if she'll follow my advice, we can fix this problem. But the Lord is wanting us to understand. There are a lot of problems we can't fix. One of, those, one of those is our sinfulness. And we can't fix it. In Malachi chapter 3, it says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But you, but who can adore the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? And what Malachi, what, what Malachi is saying to the Jewish audience is, you guys think you're ready. You think you're the chosen people. You think because you keep the Sabbath and because you wear the right kind of clothes, Eat the right kind of food, you'll be ready when Jesus comes. And Malachi, God is saying to his prophet Malachi, you're not ready. You're not. Because you cannot stand in the presence of holy God. At least not in your, not in your righteousness. <coughs> Notice how Esther responds to Mordecai. Verse 11 says, All the king's servants and the people of the king's providence know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come to the king in 30 days. Maybe in our more English vernacular, Esther was saying, are you crazy? You want me to go before the king and be executed for doing that which is absolutely unacceptable? Some commentators say that there are only six people in the entire kingdom who had direct access to the king, and the queen was not one of those six. And she's saying, look, if I do this, I'm going to die. She's saying it would be suicide before the king. And she's, 
And then she's emphatically saying to Mordecai, you know this. Mordecai is saying to Esther, there's no plan B. Mordecai realizes that unless God intervenes, there's no hope. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever come to a place where you realize you're not in control? Amen. And if God doesn't intervene, you will be defeated by Satan and his evil angels? Have you ever realized that you can't fix things that, that you have broken? And this is what Mordecai is beginning to realize. He can't fix this. What we see is that Mordecai's need becomes the fertile soil for God to begin his work. And for the first time in the book of Esther, someone, Mordecai specifically, is more willing to trust God than to trust what he can see and what he thinks he can fix. Mordecai realizes their only hope is God. And they have to have confidence that God's in control. Amen. So he says to Esther in verse 4, 13 through 14, do not think to yourselves that in the king's palace you shall escape any more than the Jews. In other words, you may think you're safe because you're the queen. But when they find when Haman finds out that you're Jewish, He'll hand you with the rest of them. He says, For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. In other words, what the guy said, I don't know God's plan is. And if you're not willing to step up and be counted on, God will find somebody else. But as he goes on to say, and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this? The book of Esther is a book that leaves a lot of questions. And why did Mordecai groom her to marry the king of Persia? You think about all the kings. This was the meanest king at that time in Persia. And Esther goes from being a poor little girl to being the most powerful woman in the Persian Empire. And there's that temptation to think, I'm the most powerful woman in the empire. Certainly, I can fix this. And Mordecai is telling Esther that the Jews don't need her. If she doesn't, intervene. Somebody else will. And Mordecai is no longer casting his hope on Esther. He has placed his hope on God and God alone. Yeah. And you think of many of the horrible disasters and the horrible wars and wonder what is God doing. He knows what he's doing. And our challenge is the willingness to trust him. Yeah. When Everything tells us there's got to be another plan. God says, don't lose your hope. I came across this quote that says, this is what faith looks like. Mordecai has no idea how God will save his people, but he refuses to believe that God will break his promises, so he is able to be at peace. Mordecai gives up control. Mordecai knew that God is a keeper of his promises. Remember when Sarah was 90 years old and the angel said, you're going to get pregnant. And she just laughed. But God kept his promise. Or remember when Isaac was on the altar and Abraham had his hand up and was ready to slay him and God said, no. God kept his promises. 
And remember when the descendants of Israel escaped Egypt? The children of Israel escaped Egypt? And they're now trapped between the army of the Egyptians and the Red Sea? And they're starting to say, Moses, why in the world did you bring us out here? We could have had our lease. And Moses says, stand still and watch God keep his promises. Amen. And he opens the Red Sea. Now, one atheist said, God didn't really open the Red Sea. It was only a foot deep. And this little boy, boy heard this atheist say that. And he got this smile on his face. And he said, isn't it amazing? God drowned the entire Egyptian army in a foot of water. <laughs> God keeps his promises. And he parted the Red Sea. Mordecai recognizes that his back against the wall is there's no plan B. And the entire Persian Empire seems to be against him and his people. And he chooses to trust God. That's really the lesson for us. What would you do if your back is against the wall and you see no way out? Will you choose to trust God or will you be looking for plan B? Mordecai has woken up and realized that at the end of the day, it is God, not the Persian Empire, who will have the last word. Amen. So Mordecai sends word back to Esther, verse 14. Who knows whether you have come to the king in such a time as this? Is that true for all of us? That we have these divine appointments and that God wants us to represent Him, to glorify His kingdom, to lift people up, to praise Him, because we've been brought to the kingdom for this time. Amen. He wants Esther to know that God can use her. And imagine how terrified she must have been. She's given all the reasons why this can't be done. And she's terrified. I think all of us could say we would be terrified if our job was to go and stand before the king. You know what real terror is? Going door to door on a gathering. Isn't that real terror? <laughs> well, good for you. <laughs> I always find it terrifying. <laughs> Pardon? Okay. okay. <laughs> Verse 16. Esther says, here's the plan. Go and gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. And do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my young women will also fast, and, and you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Now Esther could have said, you guys fast and pray. I'm going to find a beautiful gown, and I'm going to get makeup, and I'm going to be ready to go. But instead, she says, no, you fast and pray. We will fast and pray. And then I'll go before the king. So we're going to spend three days in the presence of God. And we're going to plead our case. And we're going to ask God to guide us. That's better than any gown you can buy. Or any cosmetics you can put on. What she is saying is, I am letting go of control. I am done doing the things my way. And I will no longer try to earn the king's favor through my looks. She's saying, I am throwing myself upon the mercy of God. And if the king accepts her, then it because God intervened. And God shows up, doesn't he? Yeah. It is amazing how he shows up. Even when it seems impossible, God shows up. He saves her. And he uses Esther like a mediator. Really, the, the whole focus of that fourth chapter is that we need a mediator. Amen. 
<clears throat> Esther said, if I perish, I perish. Jesus said, let me perish that I may save humanity. Amen. Esther didn't know if the king would accept her. Jesus tells us that the Father always accepts us. He never turns us away. Now, I've met a variety of people in my years of ministry who have said, I've sinned so much that God just, God can't love me anymore. That's the devil talking. God sent his son down on the cross because he loved us. He sent his Holy Spirit to be among us because he loves us. There is no sin so deep, so dark, so ugly that God will not forgive. He longs the same. So in chapter 4 we see this mediator. Jesus is our mediator. John said, sin not. But if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus. My daughter and I talked to her just a couple days ago. She saw something she didn't want to see. Red and blue, red and blue lights behind her car. $160. In our judicial system, you're innocent until proven guilty. Isn't that correct? Yeah. It doesn't always feel that way, does it? But you, when that policeman pulls you over and gives you your ticket, you don't feel very innocent, do you? But in God's judicial system, we are guilty until declared by the blood of Jesus, innocent. Isn't that wonderful? We are guilty. But our mediator, Makes us innocent. Praise the Lord. Amen. And our mediator understands us. He came and dwelt among us and wore human flesh and dealt with human problems. And he took our place and he died our death so that he might become our advocate. And so when the, when the Father looks at us, he doesn't see us, but he sees Jesus. He doesn't see our righteousness, but he sees the righteousness of Christ. On the cross, Jesus took our sins upon himself so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He is our mediator. Esther is just a metaphor. Jesus is the real thing. And like I said earlier, Jesus didn't say, if I perish. He said, let me perish so they might live. That's the kind of mediator we need. We live in a broken world full of many heartbreaking problems, but we don't have to face those problems alone. We've been given access to the creator of the universe. We've been given access to the father of the universe. And we can go to him and beg to surrender our lives to him. Anyone who's what took us so long to get there? Even when you don't see where deliverance is coming from, even when you have no idea what God is doing, you can go before him with full assurance that the God who gave his only son on your behalf will rescue you. Amen. And that's why John said in the Revelation, even so, Lord, come Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this amazing book. And even though it poses a lot of questions, it keeps us focused on the reality that you're committed to our salvation. I pray, Father, that you'll give us the courage to trust you, to put aside our plan B, and to surrender our control to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Closing hymn is hymn number 212. 